Sure. Yeah. All right, don't need to. So as I said, last week we kind of went through and, and finished uh, first Samuel, we started to move into second Samuel and we looked at some of the Psalms, but we really never made it into Chronicles. So tonight I'm going to look at probably the first 12 chapters or so of Chronicles and we'll deal with the second Samuel pieces we need to and any of the Psalms that you guys want to deal with. Um, I did get a chance to spend a little bit more time this week um, in preparation. So I've got some things that I thought were interesting I'd like to talk about. But before we get there, are there any questions about last week's readings or anything specific you wanted to hop into right here at the start? Okay, if we don't. So as I... If not, then we'll move forward. As I said last week, Chronicles is an interesting book because it's written for a different purpose. And so some of the interesting things about this, uh, on day 113, when we kind of first jump into Chronicles, uh, Tara in in the, the Bible recap asks some interesting questions. Uh, by looking at these genealogies. And the first couple of chapters, actually it's the first nine chapters of Chronicles, we get an abbreviated and moderately expanded, if you if you can understand that, genealogy. Um, and they're looking at pretty much all of Israel's history, right? Um, and so to point out this, uh, Tara has us look at two characters. One is Nimrod in First Chronicles chapter one, verse ten, and then the second one is Peleg, First Chronicles one, verse nineteen. So, I wanted to just kind of use this as an example to show you what Chronicles is trying to accomplish. So, again, I'm reading from the ESV. Um, just because it's bigger print and I haven't got new glasses that have the magnification in them that I probably should have. But um, First Chronicles chapter 1, verse 10 says, Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Now, amongst the list of <clears throat> genealogies, that's, I mean, to be given anything other than this is your dad. This is your kid. You know, that's that's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, if we were to compare that with in Genesis, where the genealogy is, you look at Genesis chapter 10. And then we're looking at verses 8 through 12. He gets not one verse, but four verses five verses and eight through 12 says Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, Akkad and Kalna and the land of Shinar. So on the one hand you have here if you were just looking at Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, and 1 Chronicles 1, verse 10, they're essentially exactly the same, right? Mm -hmm. Yet Genesis goes on to describe how Nimrod is a mighty man and actually even points to how Nimrod built a kingdom. But what is that kingdom? Babel. Yeah. Syria. Yeah. Nineveh, Assyria, Babylon. And so this is, are, are these people, these the people that God would, up to this point that God has followed? Sure. These are actually become the people that are counter to God's actions, right? Mm -hmm. And so in Chronicles, we get that he was a mighty hunter. There's an, a nod to that part, but it stops short of everything else good that he did 
because the good things that he did ultimately led to people who worked against God. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Chronicles is written specifically from the standpoint of how do these people, how do these kings, how do these leaders move us towards God's ultimate goal? Does that make sense? By the same token, a less uh, stark example um, comes in First Chronicles 1, verse 19, where it says, To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. If you counterbalance that with Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, it says, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. This one, they just keep it exactly the same. So where it benefits God's story, Chronicles keeps everything the same. Where it doesn't benefit God's story, Chronicles just conveniently leaves it out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, again, that doesn't make Chronicles a bad book, but you have to understand what its purpose is. <clears throat> there are people who have tried to look at the book of Chronicles, first and second Chronicles, and say, well, you shouldn't call that history. It is history. It's just um, history from a very specific perspective. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Any thoughts on that? Why would you think there would be value then in having the books of First and Second Chronicles when we have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Joshua, Numbers? It has all of these pieces together that does the same thing. Could it possibly be we're like children and you have to do things repetitively with us? What? Could it possibly be that we don't get it the first time? Well, yes. <laughs> I had three sons. So it took me a long time. <laughs> Part of it is sometimes you just want to get to the meat of the story. And so Chronicles is written for a very specific kind of meat. Do you, do you want to know how these people fared in whether or not they followed God and whether or not they helped God's kingdom to come? And so that's what we're going to experience mm -hmm. over and over and over again in the book of Chronicles. Um, one of the key differences... In this is a chronological study, right? Uh, the Bible recap is not reading the Bible straight through. And so we're going to hop back and forth quite a bit between Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. I mean, here we are, the first nine chapters of Chronicles has covered everything from Genesis all the way up through 1 Samuel. That's a lot to cover. Mm -hmm. But again, they're looking for a specific thread through all of that. Does that make sense? Why do you think with that in mind, why do you think they spend two chapters looking at the genealogy of the tribe of Judah. Go for it. To refresh. To refresh, yes. To it is one of the bigger tribes, yes. Jesus came from this tribe. David's line came from this tribe, though. And they saw David's line as their kingly line. 
So it's not necessarily saying the other tribes aren't important. It's just saying for the sake of God's kingdom moving forward, we're following this one. Does that make sense? Any other thoughts on that part? Yeah, the whole, the whole approach to the genealogy seems to be that everyone that they're doing deep dives on would really be more of a story of me. Because they're doing a deep dive, and sometimes, I mean, they're going into the sun, the sun, the sun, the sun, the sun, the sun, and then they get down to the when they go through his 18 sons, each <laughs> right? You know, so you're, you're skating, you're skating, you're skating, you're skating, get to a point, and then now there's a deep dive. So I'm, I'm wondering if my intellectual curiosity is going to be satisfied by, by that or if I'm just noting so approach. You, yeah, that is one thing we have to be weary of in our modern way of approaching stories. Um, we want to know each generation. We want to know what when happened in that generation. We want to know all the facts about each person. And yet the reality is this is going to skip over that. Every time we do get a name and as they start tracking down, we see the genealogy. They're at least going to give us the bridge but in this instance, they're always leading us to a point. Um, one of the, my professors, my Old Testament professor, said that the books of First and Second Chronicles are a lot like the Gospel of Mark. Mark is an action-packed gospel. And then, and then, and then, and then. And it's almost like Jesus is on a marathon and he's just going and there's no stopping with, yeah. with him in Mark, Mark's gospel. Everything's, immediate. Everything's immediately. Uh, and Chronicles kind of does the Old Testament in the same fashion. Whereas if you want the story, as you were saying, go to Samuel and Kings. And even Samuel and Kings are an abbreviated story. And there are times where they tell us everything else is written down in the book of the Kings, which there's a part of me that as a historical, as a fan of history, I wish we had that document, but it would probably be really boring because um, we haven't got read it yet, but in the book of Esther, um, they, there's a trope here where the king is tired and he wants to go to sleep, but he can't. So they have him read the minutes from the day. <laughs> they read from the book of the Kings. And at first he's starting to fall asleep and then he gets told a story and he, Oh, wait a second. We were supposed to celebrate. So, you know, bathroom reading bedside table reading. That's probably what those other books would have been. Got something? I'm telling you, Susan, if you got it, just bring it. I'm just cracking her up by some remarks, but they're not meant for you. Okay. All right. Um, can't take her anywhere. You can't take her anywhere. It's <laughs> where I need to be. Uh, another passage worth looking at. Uh, look at First Chronicles chapter 6. Um, and we're going to look specifically at verse 15. This is dealing with the descendants of the tribe of Levi. And it says, Jehozadak went into exile when the Lord sent Judah and Jerusalem into exile by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that's a lot to say in a very short sentence, is it not? Mm -hmm. Um, Tara said to compare that to three passages. Do I have anybody who would be willing to read? I need three of you. Anybody? You will? Okay. Can you look up Leviticus 26? 
and we're 14 through 17. And just if you have the study guide book, um, this is day 117 and we're looking at questions one and two. Second reader, anybody else? Okay, Kevin, look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 to 52. Third reader. Okay, John, go first Samuel chapter 12, 14 through 15. And you all online can read too. You just got to speak up because I, I'm trying to remember to look up and see you guys up there. You said 49 52, right? 49 52. Okay. Um, so again, these questions are from day 117. And I'm looking at questions one and two. Um, all right, April, you got it? Almost. Almost. Then we'll go, we'll go John first. We'll go reverse order. First Samuel 12, verses 14 to 15. If you fear the Lord, serve and obey him, and do not rebel against his commands, and if you and this king who reigns over you, follow the Lord, your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Did you guys online hear that fine? Yeah. What is what is Samuel telling us? If here in First Chronicles 6, chapter 10, it says that they got sent into exile. What is Samuel saying? They won't go well if you rebel against They must have rebelled against God. What? Okay. Go ahead, Kevin. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favor to the young. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land, and they are destroyed. They shall not leave you for, any, for new wine or oil, or the increase of your cattle. Or the offspring of your flocks until they have destroyed you. They shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified wall, in which you trust, come down throughout all your land, and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord God has given you. So here in Deuteronomy, it's saying not just that things aren't going to go well for you, like Samuel says. It says they're going to take everything good away from you. Babylon. Yep. And and they, while it doesn't name it as Babylon and it doesn't say Nebuchadnezzar, it says this is going to be a people you don't know, you don't you don't have a way of communicating with, and they're not going to treat you well. And so Leviticus. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will plead when, even when no one is pursuing you. So, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Samuel, all paint a picture of what could happen. Chronicles says it did happen. Now, what does that tell you about when Chronicles was written. Uh, it had to have been after the exile. <laughs> so there's a nice little phrase we like to use. Hindsight is 2020. 
right? Chronicles isn't just a condensed version of the rest of the story. It's a condensed version of the rest of the story from the perspective of, oh, God wasn't playing around. And so therefore, Chronicles is written in a way that not only was God not playing around, but can we figure out where we went wrong? And so they're looking for something very specific specific Gen what you know Genesis through Deuteronomy we have this story of prehistory and the nation being formed Joshua judges Ruth we have from them entering the promised land until they are finally going to become a nation there are a confederation of clans during that season the book of Samuel, first and second Samuel, is them becoming a nation. And of course, unfortunately, we know the book of Kings is about them falling apart as a nation. But the book of Chronicles is looking at the whole story to say what happened that caused us to go into exile. And can we learn that lesson so that it doesn't happen again? Well, doesn't first and second kings also kind of give you an idea that here's a good king, here's a bad king, good king, here's a bad king? Yeah, kings, kings also helps to look at all the kings, whereas Chronicles is pretty much only going to look at Judah's line. Um, and kings will be a little kinder to the kings. Um, but, but yeah. So, we really are seeing an ebb and flow of the story. And we need to get this ebb and flow of the story before you go into the prophets. Because if you don't understand the ebb and flow of the story, then the prophets aren't going to make sense. Does that, do you get what I'm saying with that? <laughs> and so here we are, we're at the pivotal point in Samuel in 2 Samuel, we finally have David becoming king. And this is a king, as, as you pointed out, this is the, the man after God's own heart. This is the one who's constantly keeping his trajectory pointed at God. Doesn't mean he's perfect. He's absolutely not perfect. Um, he falls short over and over and over again. Um, so this is where I, I want to have a, a conversation. Um, I think the first picture I sent you, can you, the one with Hebron, um, we tend to think of David ruling from where? Jerusalem. 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 Literally, the city of David, right? Yet, that's not where he starts. That, that's Mount Hermon. We'll come back to that one. So we have this map here. This is the kingdoms of David and Ishbosheth. Back to the, go back to the other one. Can you guys see that online? No. No. You'll have to share your screen there, Bruce. No. Don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> this is why we're figuring it out, right? Um, we want to think. Right after King Saul, we get David reigning over all the people of Israel. But that's not really the case. In fact, for seven years, he's really only the king over Judah. Yeah. I'm trying to stall here while they're figuring it out to get it to everybody. 
Okay. Simeon was them for the most part. Um, yeah. Say that again. Yeah, the, the southern. This is kind of a precursor to what what we will see when the kingdom redivides. But in this instance, you know, essentially we have the northern 10, 11 tribes or so, and Judah and a little bit of Simeon, a little bit of Benjamin, you know, they're in this the same category. And so well that must be in order are you getting it figured out? So, um, depending on who you talk to, uh, they would say that um, most of the people who returned were from either the tri tribes of Judah, Levi, or Benjamin. From Babylon? The ones who came back. Um there are people who have claimed that they're from the other tribes, but we, uh, the people of Israel will not, don't substantiate that because if you cannot prove your genealogy back to those, those people, then it doesn't count. Well, prior to Judah going to Babylon, didn't it, Israel, the, the other tribes go to Assyria, then Assyria take them out? Um, a big chunk of them, yes, went to Assyria, um, and and so they would say that anyone who did come back from the northern tribes was probably mixed blood anyway, and they weren't true or pure Jews. Um, so, and my son's trying to call. So... I'm sorry, guys. We're we're trying to learn this. Yes, that's not that son. It is not that son. This is the older son whose wife is is not due until October. Though. <laughs> if it was Grant, I would have said tea time out. We're going to take this call. Um, they did go to the doctor yesterday. And while they're trying to figure that out, because I really want you guys to see this map, um, be praying for Kaya because uh, our daughter in law said that our the daughter, the yeah. twins, decided rather than having her head down and being like she was supposed to, she decided to flip and go breach. She has apparently been a pill all the way through this. You know, they very clearly have one placenta on each side so they can tell which one's which. And uh, she's just been feisty. We're hoping that she gets rid of the feistiness in utero and becomes a nice <laughs> girl on the outside. So you guys online now, are you seeing the map? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we'll we'll get this figured out. So apparently we can either show it in-house or online. But not both yet. This is this is why we try to figure things out, right? Well, part of so going back to that map, just go ahead and put it up for them online. Okay. It is. I just had a... Oh, you guys are still seeing it online? No. No. Yeah, no, they're not. But now they are. Now we are. Now we are. Go to the next <laughs> the image that has the pink area and the green area. That pink is really nope. That's very pretty, but we're not to that one yet. There we go. You guys see that online? Yeah. Yes. All right. 
There we go. We're getting it figured out. Technology is wonderful once you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So this is the nation of Israel at the time of David. This is what it looked like when he first starts to rule. You have here um, in the, the pink area is right. the tribe of Judah mm -hmm. that David is ruling mm -hmm. over. The green area is the rest of of the tribes of Israel. Do you see a problem with this? Jerusalem's in the green part, right? Jerusalem is actually not in the green. It's right at the very top of the pink. Okay. So in my Bible, it's flip-flopped on colors. Yeah, it's flipped up. You got the same map, but flip-flopped, huh? Pink at the top and green down below. Gotcha. So part of Benjamin did come with them, but not all of them. And so this map shows that Benjamin's right there along the border. And you have Gilead across the, the Jordan River. Uh, you got Ephraim, Jezreel, and Asher, and, and so on and so forth. Is this anything close to the size that we typically think the nation of Israel is? No. This is a shell of what Israel was meant to be. In fact, this is even smaller than what Israel was at the end of Joshua's leadership. But notice, as you were pointing out, Jerusalem, the city that will eventually become the city of David, is at mm -hmm. the very top mm -hmm. edge of where David is ruling. Now notice Hebron, it's kind of hard for us to, I don't know if you guys can see very well up there, but Hebron is in the middle of the pink. Mm -hmm. And that is where David is anointed king. Mm -hmm. And that is where David rules for the first seven years. Um, does that feel like it's anything close to the center of Israel? Um, no. no. It's in the center of Judah's territory, yeah. but it's not in the center of Israel. Once the nation is unified when Ishbosheth's rule is over and the nation is unified. He takes Jerusalem and moves his capital to Jerusalem. Can you see why he goes to Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem in the center of the nation? No, no, it's closer, but it's not the center of the nation, but it is right at the border of the previous two kingdoms. Do you see that? Yes. So in essence, Jerusalem is chosen because it's kind of a no man's land. It didn't belong to David. It didn't really belong to Ishbosheth. So when the nation was united, that's why Jerusalem yeah. becomes the capital. Which one? Which one? Which one? It's strategic for uniting the peoples. You've already had everything. I want some more. <laughs> Does that make sense? If we were to look at a, a, a map of Israel, we would see that Jerusalem is still in the bottom third of the country. Um, but that is why David chose it. It's a, it is a wise political choice. It's also a really important city. And so if we look at 2 Samuel chapter is second samuel chapter five is it five yeah it says two to five yeah right. i'm trying to remember so this is where it mentions that he's in hebron for seven and a half years. And then he takes the next paragraph, yeah. It is about Jerusalem. Yeah. Verse six. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David, and David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites 
Let him get up the water shaft and attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Therefore, it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city around all around from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts was with him. So I didn't find a good picture of this, of Jerusalem at the time that David took it, but this was an incredibly difficult city to take. It was a walled city on top of a hill and it's on a top of a really high slanted hill. Can you go ahead and stop the, the, All right, for right now anyway. Um, so you have this interesting story here about how David took the city. David took the city by basically crawling through the sewers mm -hmm. and taking the city from the inside out. He didn't try to scale the walls. He didn't try to run up the hill and just throw his men at them. He kind of did it by deception. Yeah. Um, there, if you were to go to Jerusalem today, you can still walk some of these very same tunnels that they talk about that they would have used to bring water in and out of the city. And for the most part, most enemies don't even think about that. But David knew enough about the city. He knew that it was there and he used that to his advantage. Then once he becomes king, he expands the city so that that's not a weakness anymore, which is pretty smart, is it? When you think, yeah. When we think about the reign of David, we think of this united kingdom, right? We think of the united kingdom where God is being worshipped in Jerusalem. We think of of David truly bringing the people together, and yet that's kind of a glorified version of what's really going on the first seven years of his reign he's only reigning over one tribe he has to take jerusalem and make it the capital city um the last what is it 15 years of his reign he's fighting with his own kids over whether or not he's going to continue to reign david's reign was not everything it's cracked up to be either and, and for me, that's a great comfort because, well, let's be honest. Are any of our lives perfect? No. Are any of our lives storybook? No. <laughs> Some of us could probably make a case that our lives are great stories and maybe tragedies, but not necessarily storybook, right? When we have that perfect family Christmas picture, it's very staged, right? That's the way most of our lives are. What? Yeah, some of our photos are, are rather interesting. And I'm sure that your families are the same way. When we look at the greatest person in the Old Testament that everyone looked at, and they try to idealize his era as the leader. We see a flawed man whose life is not perfect. And for me, that truly is great comfort. Well, none of the great leaders were perfect. None of the great leaders were perfect. And I think that, can you be a good Christian and not study the Old Testament? I sure. I mean, you can. You can spend your entire life just reading the Gospels, and you'd do a lot of good by just reading and studying the Gospels and studying the life of Christ and trying to live the way Christ tells us to live. Mm -hmm. If you get done with the Gospels, you can do a lot of good by reading the letters and figuring out how the church struggled to be the church and, and studying all that and trying to do better. All of that's great. But what we call the Old Testament tells us a much fuller grace 
faith-filled story, we get the picture that God is long-suffering, that God is kind beyond what any of us would call rational thought. I mean, the greatest characters of the Old Testament are so almost irredeemably flawed, and yet God uses them anyway. That's really good news, isn't it? I preached out of Zephaniah uh, chapter 3 Sunday. Uh, I, I don't know why I never ever really thought about it. Chapter 3, uh, verse 17, talking about how God will sing over us. Mm. His love is so great, he would sing over us. I mean, this, I told you, I said, that's like the... Uh, not the third time, not the third opportunity, but like the 54,000 opportunity of Israel to get it right. And yeah, um, it, it just goes to show us, the Old Testament shows us we can't do it on our own. What Christ does, it, it gives us an opportunity to do better on our own, but we, we're not doing it on our own when we get to, to the, the gospel. So, since you referenced it, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is a living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Now, remember, Tomorrow. this is talking about the broken Israelites of the Old Testament. As you said, this isn't even talking about Christians who have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, like I said on Sunday. You know, we get the full octane Holy Spirit now. They just had bare minimum Holy Spirit in their life. And they didn't even know how to listen to what little Holy Spirit they had most of the time. And yet God sang over them with delight. How much more does God sing praises over how we are living and how we are exhibiting his love and his mercy and his goodness. Even when we fall short, I saw your cringe there, John, we fall short a lot. And yet God still praises us for how well we're doing. It makes me think a lot about how you handle infants and toddlers right it when when hudson was probably what about 10 months old we finally got him to clap yay and and he was so excited to be able to clap this week he learned how to twirl and and then twirl and try to walk in a straight line and promptly fall down and you know we over exaggerate our joy at what they're doing because we want them to keep moving forward have you ever thought about the fact that God the Father is the greatest cheerleader that there ever has been? Yeah. I mean, Scripture says that heaven rejoices when one sinner comes to Christ. God's up there going, yeah, come on, guys, keep going. You're almost there. And he was saying that even back then with this really ragtag broken group imagine how much more he's saying it for you even when you fall short and man that should be really good news shouldn't it there, there's a scene in the last i'm trying to think what episode it is that the chosen where jesus is healing he's healed the the blind woman remember that one and 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 her friend is not worried about it and all of a sudden, Jesus stops in the middle of the road and says, wait for it. And then all of a sudden, you hear him cheering because he's been healed. And he goes, there it is. I, I said, that must be God waiting for us. <laughs> he's looking at all the angels going, wait for it. And then when that person gives their life to Christ, says, there it is. You know? <laughs> there it is. One of the things, uh, <laughs> any other thoughts about what we've read up to this point from Samuel 
and Chronicles looking at David's reign. With no commercial. You know, thoughts, questions? Uh, I kind of like when I was reading uh, question number four on the page uh, on day 117, it says, what new role does David establish for the service of the temple in 6, 31, 32? Okay, let's let's look at that. First Chronicles chapter six. Mm -hmm. Back, I was in back in Second Samuel's again. So, First Chronicles. The, now these are the men who David appointed service of song and six. after the ark came to rest. They were ministering with music before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of meeting until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And they served in their office according to their order. And I saw the first praise team. So, yes. <laughs> first Chronicles chapter 6, verses 31 and 32 shows David creating a new order within the community. And as, uh, as Kevin said, it's the first praise team. It's the first chancel choir. Yes. This is the first group that their only job is to sing God's praises. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about that? Do you guys have any idea of the significance of that? We haven't read it yet. Okay. They're probably with the music, so they had to be creating. They were probably creating music. Yep. It was they kind of had their only responsibility. Uh, then, then they're about that virtually, you know, nonstop. They are about praising God nonstop. Yep. Uh, up until then, basically, the only real music was the horns that they blow at, at, off at before any kind of festival, right? I mean, they didn't really have any what I would call hymns. The thing of, yeah, I mean, David had songs that he wrote for himself that he sang, but um, not, not anything corporate. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want to pick up on this, and this is not what Tara, where Tara goes, at least in the daily guide, but I need two readers. Anybody online want to read? I'll read. I'll read. Okay, uh, Robert, would you look up Revelation chapter 4? And we're going to look at verses 8 through 11. Anybody in house want to read? Susan? Yeah. Okay, I want you to read, uh, go to Isaiah chapter 6. Robert, when you're there, let me know. I'm there, 8 to 11. Verses 8 to 11. You want to read that for us? Sure. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created okay and now susan if you want to look and and we'll do uh, one through seven okay in the year that king uzziah 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 died I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. 
And one cried to the to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The holy earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man unclean lips, of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king and the Lord of the host. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the, with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your inquiry is taken away and your sin purged. Okay, so Kevin, I want you to reread those verses from First Chronicles chapter 6 again. Uh, I got it. First Chronicles 6, 31 and 32. Oh, 31 and 32, yes. Sorry, I was, I was following along. Sorry, I didn't warn you. Now, these are the men whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest. They were ministering with music before the dwelling place of the tabernacle meeting until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, and they served in their office according to their order. Can you see how David is mirroring, maybe without knowing it even, what Isaiah sees of heaven and what John tells us about what's going to ha happen in heaven for all time? For the first time, probably ever humanity is finally being who god created us to be now again david's not perfect but what is it we said about david he's always pointed towards god and that's why these two verses are so important is because we're finally beginning to see humanity living with God, praising God, worshiping God, doing what God called us to do. We don't do it perfectly, but we're finally getting there. That's why God said that they were man after his own heart, because every time David messed up, where did he turn? He turned back to God. Back to God. Whereas the Israelites all turned back to Egypt. <laughs> any thoughts on that? Or any other questions? Today's reading, we'll spend the last 20 minutes or so talking about Psalms, but I'll be honest, whenever I opened things up and I went to today, I'm like, Wait a second, one chapter? Yeah. And then I was thinking, oh, this must be that is it one one nineteen or whatever, you know, that's like five hundred pages long. No. She gives us one chapter, three verses with three verses. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it from the New Living, um, because that's what I have up here on the computer. I'll read it again uh, from the, the ESV that I have here as well. It says, how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. As believers, how much do we value harmony? I love when people get along. Sometimes not enough. What do you say? I love it when people get along. You love it when people get along. Okay, I'm going to read it again 
this time from the ESV. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. How do we... It's so interesting that this is our verse for today. This is this is what happens. At the same time, uh, for some of us, a good friend is is out in North Carolina. I've got a lot, number of friends out there. Our former denomination is is trying to figure out who they are and where they're going to head. I've had I can't tell you how many conversations in the last five months about the unity of the body of Christ. This coming Sunday, uh, my sermon is on the church. And for the next five weeks, we're going to talk about the church. Church, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. That's what the, the Nicene Creed says. And so next week, we're going to talk about one church. What does it mean that we are one church? This notion of unity and harmony is a key understanding for God, is it not? And yet, um, when when Kevin and I were in seminary, at that point in time, I think there's something like 18,000 different denominations in the United States that were officially recognized. I've heard that it's well over 25,000 now. Is that unity? When Susan and I got saved and we were trying to decide what church to go to, there was 135 churches in Kokomo, Indiana. 135 because we counted everyone. That's what was in the yellow pages, by the way. <laughs> Might have been more, but oh, wow. And then how many Methodist churches was in town? How many Baptist churches was in town? One of my first questions is why, why is it not just one Methodist church? And so there, that is an important question for us to wrestle with. Why is there not just one? Well, I think first the question we have to answer, and, and this is going to get into my sermons for the next couple of weeks, so I'm not going to go all the way there, but I, I want us to acknowledge, because she makes such a big deal out of these three verses, we get a whole day. Some, some days we had like seven and eight and nine psalms in a single day, and yet today we only get three verses. Well, first of all, what absolutely must we be united in? Christ. 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 Above all else, anyone who truly calls on Christ mm -hmm. is our brother or sister. Well, for the people of Israel, when this was written, mm -hmm. for them, what did that look like? It was anyone who worshipped Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Which is part of the reason why we're our faiths, the Hebrew Jewish faith and the Christian faith, are often from the world's perspective lumped together. This is the Judeo-Christian faith. Jews don't always like us. We're not very good Jews. But they acknowledge that we're kind of following the same God. We understand often that Jews worship the same God. They just haven't figured out how important Jesus is yet. Yeah. The worship of God the Father is a key aspect of who we are. And that in and of itself is one of the defining characteristics of what brings us unity. So you brought up that here in Kokomo, when you guys started looking, there was 135 churches. Well, 
um, one of my first churches that I served, our second parsonage was in Corridon, Indiana. And at the time that I got moved to Corridon, Indiana, that was two, 2007, there were 33 active United Methodist churches in Harrison County. Wow. Now, as far as Indiana counties go, Harrison County is the largest by land mass. So it stands to reason it should have more than others, but 33? So I started doing some research and I found that at the beginning of the, of the, the 20th century in the early 1900s, Harrison County had 82 Methodist churches in it. Why was there such a need? Well, at the time, we didn't have automobiles. Okay. And so they put churches where enough people could gather together and could walk there if necessary. Does that mean that they're disunited? Mm -hmm. Unity is not bound to place. And that's a struggle the Jewish people dealt with. They truly believed that the only way to worship God was in the temple in Jerusalem. And there are still Jews that think the same thing today. These are Zionist Jews, and they would love nothing more than to blow up the Dome of the Rock and to start building again. Yet... When Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman at the well, what does he tell her? Our people worship in Jerusalem. Your people worship here in Shechem. But the day will come when all believers will worship me in spirit and in truth. So let me be very clear. The unity that we have was never meant to be tied to a place. God uses places, absolutely. God uses Jerusalem over and over again. God uses Shechem before Jerusalem is chosen. God uses the roaming tabernacle, right? I mean, it was moving around all over the place. God dwells with his people. So our unity, our harmony is never meant to be in one location. Um, here I am, I'm sitting here and I'm looking straight down this hallway in what used to be the sanctuary, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the back of what currently is our sanctuary. And there was a big movement for a number of years, probably about 20 years, where churches just kept building bigger and bigger sanctuaries, mm -hmm. right? That's why we built that big sanctuary in the early 80s. And, and as a whole, there's nothing wrong with a bigger sanctuary. But we have to be cautious about that because that begins to build and we all know people and i'm not saying we have them in this church and i really hope we don't but we all know people for whom their sanctuary has become an idol a building was never meant to be what unifies us and the people of israel while they were encouraged to make at least one pilgrimage to Jerusalem in their lifetime, no one was expected to go there for every holiday, every year. It's just not possible. Yeah, a lot of them couldn't afford it. A lot of them absolutely couldn't afford it. And that's why when you take a closer reading of Leviticus, you see that there are provisions made for how to worship God and fulfill those requirements when you can't do the norm. So the unity that's being talked about here really isn't even centered on Zion. Because notice who wrote the psalm. David. David. David knows that while he wanted Jerusalem to become the seat of God's worship, was there a temple in Jerusalem in David's time? No, it wasn't. No, 
What, did they set up the tabernacle? They did bring the tabernacle eventually to Jerusalem, yes. But but even in his lifetime, it moved around. Mm -hmm. So that's not what unites us. Are we united in our understanding of how God works? I'm having an ongoing debate with my uh, daughter's boyfriend about finer points of theology. And, but what we're talking about is not anything that is contained in the Nicene Creed. You know, the last couple of weeks on Sunday morning, I've been preaching through the Nicene Creed, right? We've been preaching on, you know, our belief, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. And now we're moving into the church. I've said for years, those core doctrines are what unites us. Anything beyond that, as the saying goes, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity or love. We are meant to be loving to all of our brothers and sisters at the other, I'm going to guess there's probably closer to 155 churches now. Some have closed since then, some have open but there's still a lot of churches around town but to be clear as long as i'm the pastor of the connection church yes we might have two campuses but we're not in competition with anybody else in town and if i'm not the pastor that's going to help you grow in your faith i will gladly help you find another church around that you can go to and we are fortunate because right now many of you guys are joining us for bible study online there are hundreds of thousands of churches that you can now watch their services online too. Now, let me be very clear, and this is a, a hint towards Sunday. Online is okay, but it's not a substitute for being with brothers and sisters. And pretty much all of you guys that are online, you guys either come here on Sunday morning or you go and you join another body. And that's the unity that's the harmony that I believe David is talking about here in Psalm 133. Now, I did have a couple of pictures just to show you. Um, can you give me the other map, Bruce? Now that we've got it figured out how to share screen and, and for the people online to see it. And so this right here, you see down at the bottom of the map, there's that circle. That's the Sea of Galilee. Um, oh, it was. lost it there. Can you guys see it online? No. Nope. Yeah. Not yet. Bruce is figuring it out. Hmm. Share a screen. Yep. Okay. Now, can you guys see the map? No. We see his screen. Computer screen. You see the computer screen, but not the map, huh? Right. That's it. Technology is great when, you, when it works and we know how to figure it out, but that's why this is our first week using it. Pretty design. <laughs> when, when David wrote that song, wasn't most of Israel at peace? So this is traditionally, while he's bringing that up, and you guys can hear me online, traditionally they say that he wrote this psalm after he was finally king over the entire nation. Yeah which is why we get it at this point in time in our reading plan is David is finally serving a unified kingdom. And so there's a, there's a sense in which he's saying, you know, look at the beauty of this. We're finally all together. Um, we're finally all worshiping together. We're finally all going in the same direction. Um, and so 
and, and it's finally established as the kingdom of right yes and it is finally established as one fully unified kingdom of israel that it, it was kind of that under saul but as we read all the way through first samuel it's not really a unified kingdom under saul yeah. can everybody see the that map online now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the bottom of it, you have the Sea of Galilee, and it shows Capernaum there. This is, this is, of course, at this point in time in David's day, Capernaum doesn't exist. But this is the center of where Jesus's ministry kind of radiates out of, the area of Capernaum. The city of Dan, uh, if you remember a couple weeks back, some of you weren't uh, joining us yet at that point when we were reading in Genesis I talked about the great Western story of Abraham and he chased the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah all the way up to Dan. When the upper right hand corner of this map, you see Mount Hermon. Mm -hmm. Mount Hermon is the highest point within Israel. And so when David says in Psalm 133, Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even everlasting life. Mount Hermon was seen, even though many times throughout their history, they had land beyond Mount Hermon. It was seen as kind of the northernmost point. Can you bring up the other picture? Can we do that can you guys see that picture yeah. online can you guys see it uh -huh. yes. yes this is a picture across the valley towards mount herman that mountain range is almost always snow covered the the snow that melts from mount herman flows down it's what fills the sea of galilee the sea of galilee runs into the jordan river the jordan river goes into the dead sea when they're talking about the dew from mount hermon they are literally talking about the water that brings life to the entire valley now Interesting little tidbit. Most people believe that it's on Mount Hermon where Jesus is transfigured. And so he shows himself for his full divine glory to Peter, James, and John. Um, many people also claim that it's at Mount Hermon where uh, Satan fell. And so when Jesus shows himself as divine, he is reversing the the evil that happened to the world when satan fell now those are just interesting pieces we don't have any full proof of either of those but i show you this picture to show you we think of israel as more of an arid middle eastern country right we we want to think of it as almost even a desert wilderness country yet even today mount hermon has snow on it even today mount Hermon is a place where the water flows from and it brings life to the rest of the valley and so when david is talking here in psalm 133 and it says it says behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity it is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. Verse 3 is pulling this imagery that you see of the water that comes from the mountains, the water that will bring the spirit bring life verse two is also kind of odd for us mm -hmm. um when we anoint people today what do we tend to do give them a towel <laughs> we give them a towel well back then you needed to but in the few times in my ministry where 
I've been anointed or I've done anointing, mm -hmm. typically it's just a little bit of oil mm -hmm. on the forehead, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of oil on the hand if they don't want on the forehead. That doesn't, I mean, the times I've been anointed and prayed over, those are powerful times. But the oil is meant to be an example of God's blessings being poured out. When we put just a little bit of oil on the forehead, is that very extravagant? Yeah. No. Now, we don't want to have to send people home and try and figure out how to get a bunch of olive oil out of their clothes because that makes laundry really difficult. But the imagery here, when they anointed Aaron as high priest, when they anointed Saul and David as king, it wasn't just a little bit of oil on the forehead. They took the jar, not the little bitty 16 ounce bottles of olive oil we buy at the grocery store. They took the jar. It was probably a gallon of olive oil and they dumped the whole thing out. Kind of like the Gatorade. That's probably the best imagery from our our world today. The Gatorade splashed on the coach at the end of the game when they win, right? That's the imagery that's being evoked with this second verse. God's blessings are that extravagant. And then that pulls it back to verse one. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony or unity, it's that kind of goodness. When we learn to live together, yeah. when we learn to understand that denominations aren't bad, the other churches around us aren't bad, we're not in competition with them. We can work together and bring good for the kingdom when we understand how we are unified. And we are unified in our worship of Jesus Christ, in our worship of God the Father, in our reliance and worship on the Holy Spirit, and in our core doctrines of belief. If we start trying to force unity beyond that, then we're getting beyond what God has asked of us. Is that fair? Sure, kind of. When you go to 122 in, in the book, the, the blue book. Yes. She's kind of pointing back towards um, Lot and Abram, not be able to, to land, not be able to support them. And then Esau and Jacob not being able to live in the land together. And how this kind of brings that all back together, all of Israel now. Yeah, so if in case, did you guys hear what Kevin said online? No. Kinda. He was talking about how, how for today's readings and in uh, Tara's study guide for day 122, that how she talks about Lot and Abraham separating because the land could not support both of them. And how Jacob and Esau separate because the land cannot support both of them. And yet David is saying now those separations are being mended that the people of God are coming back together. And of course, as Christians, that's what we believe we have in Christ. It's not just Israel coming back together, but now it's truly all of God's people coming back together. And we're about done and we're, we're at eight o'clock here, but I want to give one more piece. I love the imagery of the book of Revelation around this concept. It says, and then the 144,000 will be bowing down, worshiping God. Now, that number is not meant to be seen as an exact number. Sometimes you get exact numbers, and sometimes you get what, what we learned in seminary is called a stylized number. When I say, and if I say to infinity and back, you know, I'm saying as far as I could possibly go, anywhere and everywhere in between, right? When they use that number, 144,000, for them, it was a stylized number that meant 12 times 12 times 1,000. 12 
standing for the 12 tribes of Israel, everyone who believed in God through the work of Israel. The second 12 is for the 12 apostles, which is the New Testament church. Everyone who believed in God through the <laughs> teachings of the 12 apostles. Because the number 1,000, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, in Jewish culture, the number 1,000 is their infinity. Now, yes, they had numbers higher than 1,000, but it's in the same way that we talk about a perfect 10. You can count higher than that. It's funny. I got to tell a story. So when our son Blake first met Gabe, Gabe is Madison's boyfriend, and they were figuring out, and Blake was just really disappointed because he says, I've got to give you a nine and a half. So I guess instead of call, putting it on a 10 scale, we're going to make it an 11 scale. So you're not quite as perfect as I thought you were. But yet we have this notion, right, in our culture. 10 is like the perfect high number. There's far better numbers than that. Or if it comes to a grading scale, we talk about 100%, right? That that's the perfect number. Well, for the Jewish people, 1,000 was their, this is it. This is everything. So in Revelation, when it says 144,000, it's literally saying all of those who worship God from the 12 tribes of Israel and all of those who worship God because of the ministry of the 12 apostles. And that's the unity that is being evoked from Psalm 133. Now, we don't have this much time to dig into every single psalm. But I hope that you're beginning to get a sense for how God's word can be read at the surface level, and it's phenomenal, right? But we can also meditate on his word, dwell in his word, feast on his word, and find a deep and enriching life. Fair enough? Amen. Any final thoughts before I close this in prayer? I think next week we're finally going to get back into the story. Nope, we get a whole bunch more Psalms. David was kind of prolific, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Sure. We're going to move into probably through 2 Samuel chapter 9 and 1 Chronicles chapter 18, it looks like. So... Pastor Sam, I yeah. do have a question. Uh, you can stop sharing the screen, Bruce. Um, I just want to tell you how my, beautiful that picture of Mount Hermon is, and it really tells me a lot. Just explains so many things in that 133 chapter. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I'm, I'm glad that you saw the beauty of that, and it was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Patty. Well, I just, I don't know. I guess my question is, is Psalm 10, let's see, what what is it? 104, uh, 20, when you make darkness and it is night. Um, I guess I, I had not noticed that until Tara brought it to our attention that God made darkness. Now, I was always with the assumption that darkness was evil you know it's just another way of saying evil or that darkness actually scientifically i guess doesn't exist um it's just a lack of light that's what darkness is so i was wondering what your thought because i'm just pondering that i was i'm trying to so i guess what think I about it. Think of, um a handful of things on this notion. Uh, we're looking at Psalm 104, and we're looking specifically at verse 20. Uh, the New Living says, You send the darkness, and it becomes night, when all the forest animals prowl about. Um, and then ES, or, yeah, the ESV, Psalm 104, um, says, I want to just, just so we have a couple of different translations. Uh, NIV says you bring darkness. Um, Psalm 104 in the ESV says you make darkness and it is night. What number? Psalm 104, verse 20. 
No 20. Thank you. So, yeah. again, there are levels of imagery that are evoked in the Hebrew language. Um, darkness in and of itself is never actually evil. Um, in fact, at the very beginning, darkness is labeled as night and it is seen as very good. Well, it is seen as good. Not, um, and we have to remember that. The reality is without night, we couldn't live. Without night causing our bodies to want to rest, we would not have the ability to survive. Without night, plants wouldn't be able to grow and do what they need to do. Without winter, seeds wouldn't be able to germinate. We need both. The problem is we allow the parts that we don't understand to become synonymous with things like evil. Jesus does say that, you know, they will be cast out where there's darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. But that doesn't mean that the darkness in and of itself is evil. Does that make sense, Patty? Yes, yes. I was just trying to grasp it or to understand. I did, I've never seen it as a... Darkness is neutral mm -hmm. in the same way that light is new day is not good or bad it is mm -hmm. night is not good or bad it is it's a part of the rhythms that god has brought into the world and the rhythms themselves are very good the unfortunate side of it is is that the enemy has begun to use the darkness for his advantage does that make sense Yes, and, and there's no darkness, right, in heaven at all. There's no need for darkness, right? There's no need for darkness. Okay. And there is no darkness within Christ. Right. Okay. Okay, it just makes, you know, opens my eyes a little wider. and That's a good question. It really is. We have to remember that everything that God made in and of itself is good, but just like us as humanity, we were made very good, yet we can and often are twisted by evil. Right? True. True. So, good final thought. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for that reminder that, Lord, you made all of creation good. You made all of us very good. Each one of us is made in your image. And, Lord, each and every church that calls on your name is truly a part of your kingdom. May we truly live in that unity. May we see all of creation through your eyes. And, Lord, may we live lives that glorify you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings to you all. We'll, we'll have this far better figured out for next week and uh, we'll keep moving forward. Have Thank, a you. Thank you. Good. Bye. Bruce, you want to go ahead and stop the recording? You sounded the back of the shirt. What's the meaning of the report?